we know that there are patients who do very poorly and patients who do well. And do you want to speak a little bit, uh, maybe, Paul, first of all, to uh, what, what defines a high-risk myeloma patient in your mind? Well, it's a great question. I think to um, Saga's point, I think genetics helps us to some degree. But I think we all recognize as busy clinicians that there are patients who take us greatly by surprise in terms of how poorly their disease behaves. And I think one of the most important aspects of how a, a high-risk patient can be defined is, on the one hand, clinically, on the other hand, genetically, obviously the two are, are related, but sometimes it's, it's, it's not as clear-cut. And then the other thing becomes how they respond to treatment. And I think in that regard, um, being very vigilant about degree of response, rapidity of response, and aware of these aspects is key. In terms of clinical practice, I, I look for signs such as extramedullary disease, um, tumor burden, ISS stage, and of course genetics, particularly things like deletion 13. But having said all of that, um, I think our best understanding... Deletion 17. Sorry, deletion 17, I apologize, yeah. yeah. Uh, 17p deletion, I apologize. Um, and you're absolutely right, deletion 13 was thought to be the sort of Damocles and clearly isn't now. Um, but I, I think that um, the complexity of the disease, as Saga points out, is one of our biggest challenges in predicting who is gonna do what and why. Your, uh, your group uh, has talked about uh, some therapies that might be agnostic to genomics which make people high risk. Do you wanna tell the audience what that's all about? Well, I think, you know, when you, when you use agents that uh, require their function to be dependent on intracellular mechanisms like proteasome inhibitors and IMIDs, and your group has done a huge amount of work to tell us the pathways for IMIDs, um, uh, I think that then you're dependent on uh, development of resistance through those same intracellular mechanisms. And what we've talked about is the idea that immune-based therapies may be able to circumvent all that by working on the extracellular surface on an antigen that's outside recruiting in immune cells. And that's been the biggest issue, the ability to recruit in immune effector cells to ultimately kill the cell. You may be able to avoid a lot of those intracellular crossed wiring that, that are so difficult for And this us. is what's gonna make today's discussion so much fun because we have some drugs now that, that we can actually target extracellularly as well as intracellularly. I just wanted to add yeah. to, to Paul's comment about the genetics that I think particularly for community docs, it's important to look at those genetic reports that they're getting because all the myeloma studies that are done are really on plasma cell specific tests. So either it's sig fish where the immunoglobulin is, is first um, stained and then the fish is done on those cells or CD138 is selected fish. And when, pay, when folks get reports that are not plasma cell specific, it's really hard to know what to do with that relative to the literature. And even somebody, and not to mention, even if you have those specific tests, the amount of deletion 17P, for example, matters. So I think just the presence of deletion 17P in and of itself really is not enough. You really need to know a lot more. And I think it's important that we work in a collaboration with community doctors to really clarify these kinds of issues. And, and that actually, just to build on that a little bit, the revised international staging system takes just that into account. Right. Um, by adding in FISH and LDH and some other methods, it's now more than just beta-2 and albumin. And what are those? Are FISH, LDH, uh, beta-2 microglobulin and albumin all combined together? Well, yeah. So it's basically the ISS staging, the beta-2 and the microglobulin, um, uh, and then and, and the, and the albumin. Yeah. And then you can up or down stage based on the presence right, or absence right. of high-risk right. features. What about the microenvironment of all of this, uh, Dr. Shah? What, 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 how does that impact so, us? One more thing I think that's important. We talk about some of these risk um, stratifications and um, prognostic criteria focused around the disease and the biology of the disease. But I think that as practicing community oncologists, I think one thing we have to keep in mind is that the patient themselves, and so we see the kind of the elderly patients or the ones with the comorbidities, and so some of these patients may not be able to tolerate our therapies. And so ultimately the definition of high risk is somebody who passes away in the first 18 to 24 months. Mm -hmm. And that could be due to disease, but it could be due to just the patients of the comorbidity, and I think that's important to keep in mind. The second thing is sometimes we focus on saying this is a high-risk patient at the time of diagnosis, but then clinically and biologically, you're saying some patient surprises, so they may not have these features, and then they get therapy and they progress within the first 18 months or 12 months, and they progress quickly after transplant. So clinically, that patient may not have deletion 17P or any of these features, but they behave that way, and so we have to treat them that way. So I think we have to be cognizant of those patients who aggressively relapse very quickly need to be thought of as a high-risk patient. So, so it's so not just, just what you see at the baseline, yes. it's what you see throughout. So for our community group. oncologists watching, the, the message seems to be um, it, you should do FISH for genetic profiling and risk. Mm. You should measure the beta-2 microglobulin and albumin uh, for, for risk through biochemistry. Uh, 
but you should also assess the patient as part of that complex. Is that fair yes. to say? And I, what about frailty, Paul? Is that an yeah. issue? Do you measure that formally or just eyeball it? Um, I, I think, uh, you know, I, I think it's a complex assessment actually because frailty is uh, again an area where you, prediction is not always so straightforward um, and I think there's the younger frail patient and there's the older more robust patient and dissecting the two is not, not necessarily as uh, black and white as one might imagine. Um, to Jatin's point, I think that uh, for the community docs listening it's very important to look at renal function for example, d depth and breadth and extent of bone disease and understand any uh, presence of extramedullary uh, disease that there may be, and that's where additional imaging like yeah, PET-CT may, may become so relevant. Do you think, yeah. well, let, mm. me, let me ask um, mm. Dr. Cherry, do you do PET-CT scan routinely at diagnosis? Or? I do it where it's going to make a difference in management or monitoring. So for somebody who might be smoldering and you're going to try to figure out whether or not you're going to treat, absolutely. Yeah. If somebody we think um, has is being treated primarily for bone disease, it helps to monitor that patient after therapy because that's really why you're treating these patients. Or somebody who there's either molecular high risk or some concern for extramedullary disease. So I think in those kinds of settings, I would routinely do the PET. But if you have clear lytic lesions and there's no other, none of those other concerns, do we really need the extra cost that's not gonna change your management? I'm glad you mentioned smoldering because I want to move to that. But just to wrap up this story of complexity of disease and, and therapeutic choice, uh, any last comments on that part from the panel? I think what Jatin was bringing up is really important, which is when we look at and we talk about studies coming out, particularly for high risk, it's important to not just look at the response rate, but the durability of response, because even high risk patients may have a very deep response, but who cares if it la doesn't last? And actually, that's the normal thing. They actually quite exactly. chemotherapy sensitive. Right. They just have explosive relapse, which then becomes unmanageable. And those are the patients, really the patients we have to focus our energies on. Correct. And, and if I may, Keith, I think that the other takeaway, I hope, is that now we're in a position where we have really the highest level of evidence to support three and even arguably four drug approaches in the initial phase of treatment that can literally put this net around our patients in a way that some of these other confounding factors are less likely to emerge as a problem for our patients.